Uh, I, I'm gonna, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Gaston Baudet. But first, I'd better tell you who I am, because I think maybe there aren't so many people who know who I am. My name is John Hayes. I'm an alumni of the college. Uh, I was here back in the early 80s, the 70s and 80s. It seems like a long time ago. And uh, I have stayed involved. I'm the chairman of the advisory board for the, uh, the college. And, uh, and an adjunct faculty member. And an adjunct faculty member. That's right. And uh, I have known Gaston, our speaker here, for, gosh, I had to think about, about it a little bit. It's been over 10 years. And I first met him online. Uh, and uh, we eventually met at an astronomy uh, conference here in Tucson. And he had, runs a little company, I'll tell you about in a minute, and he sold me some equipment, and we met, and we really hit it off, because we were both interested in astronomy and optics and interesting technical problems. So, a very interesting, smart guy, uh, and one of the things I like about Gaston is he pushes me to think about things. He asked me questions about optics that I thought I knew all about, and of course, I have to pause a little bit and realize maybe I need to think about this a little before I answer. So it's always fun to interact with him. Uh, he has a, uh, an interesting background. He has an undergraduate degree in mechanics and electronics. Uh, his master's degree is in electrical engineering and computer science from the Swiss University of Applied Science. Uh, he has a PhD in machine learning from the National Conservatory of Arts and Crafts in Paris. Uh, he was a professor at the Swiss University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland, working on uh, signal image processing and control systems. But most of his, uh, his work has been done in private industry, uh, where he worked on new technology development and strategic R&D. He's published numerous papers and has been granted over 35 patents. I know he has a number of them pending right now. Uh, one notable project uh, that he had that I really like was he designed a hyperspectral optical optoelectronic machine vision system for recognizing counterfeit money. Um, he's also worked on machine vision systems for sorting diamonds and watch identification for Rolex. So he really is a Swiss guy. Uh, currently, he's the founder and president of Innovation Foresight, a manufacturer of innovative uh, products for astronomy. He's developed an on-axis guiding system that enables real-time autofocus systems for deep sky imaging and a Shaq Hartman wavefront analyzer. And I use a lot of his equipment on my, on my astronomical imaging systems. Uh, he's developed the fir world's first uh, correlation guiding and autocorrelation correlation autofocusing based systems for astronomical imaging. Um, and uh, his newest product is an AI based wavefront sensing system that uses only the imaging camera in a, in a telescope to allow precision optical evaluation and alignment. And that's what we're going to hear more about today, and it's some really interesting stuff. So at this point, I'll turn over the podium to Gaston. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, I'd like also to thank here the uh, University of Arizona, the, the Wyant Col uh, College of Optical Science, its faculty members, the staff, and of course John again, for uh, this great opportunity to be here today before you. Um, you know, most of my life, working life, I was involved in R&D, doing uh, research on new technology to apply them on new products. So I'm coming from that field of applied science. And this presentation today is not going to be any different. So I split the presentation in two parts. One is a slideshow to talk about the technology in, in this context of telescope. And the other one is an actual demonstration on an optical bench here. So that you can see how does it work live. I think it's always useful to see that. So let's start with the slideshow. Uh, Although the technology can be used in many different fields, my first uh, motivation was in the field of astronomy because the type of customer we have. And they have scopes stretching from small ones to very big ones. And they all have something in common at the very least. Those scopes are usually are, uh, reflectors with mirrors. And they need to be aligned right in order for the optics to do the job. An alignment of those telescopes is critical. Now, short of taking the scope and going to a shop with an interferometer and an expansive flat mirror, or uh, using maybe a, a Shackhartman on site, you are left with just guessing the quality of your uh, optics by looking at image of things like defocus star. And this is nice, but it's qualitative uh, uh, information. Not to mention you cannot uh, act on it. If you want to do active optics, for instance, you need a way to get data. So 
This idea here is to do quantitative data optical uh, testing and supporting alignment of telescope. And again, it's not a limitation of the technology, but that's the first application. I'm going to say a little bit more in detail how does it work. So the key goals and objectives for this application has been no extra hardware for the customer. We don't want the customer to buy anything hardware-wise. Buy the software, that's fine, but not the hardware. Uh, using customer existing camera and means to defocus, because we need some level of defocus to deal with phase ambiguity in the problem. Um, the other thing is we want to work with actual star as well as artificial one in the lab. We are in a temporarily incurrent light situation and we are under seeing limited condition. By that, I mean we need to be able to get the wavefront even under Earth uh, turbulence, because most of those scopes are somewhere on Earth and they shoot, uh, well, they look at the light through the atmosphere. So it needs to work on this condition, and sometimes seeing can be pretty large, and noise could be large if you consider the aperture of the telescope. And the another, another thing we like to do is a common pass image-based wavefront sensing. We don't want to add more optical components in the process, which will require some kind of calibration, right? And that is one of the key concepts. We reuse the system with the same optics, then the science, the camera will see. Now, when you talk about alignment of telescope, and I can say that firsthand, <laughs> usually there are many waves of error on the wavefront before you reach the alignment you are looking for, which means we need to be a, having a very high dining branch uh, in a system such we don't face two pi phase wrapping problems kind of things. We want a single image to do the job. The image may have one star or more than one star if you have a star field, which is useful in the context of the whole field wavefront sensing. When you do that, and it's very useful for active optic, you can get aberration of axis and on axis at once. And not going to the deep uh, detail, there are a lot of work done on that, uh, specifically in the context of the VLT. If you access the, the, the information across the field, then you can use that to control the active optics for supporting the actuator of the primary mirror and realigning the optics as you go. And that's one of the goals of this technique. Another very important aspect, we want to be fast. So no iteration or any kind of optimization or solver at runtime. For two reasons. First, it may be long. You never know how much iteration you may need. You may have convergence issue local minima problem, those kind of things. We don't want to have that. Not to mention, I don't want my customer to deal with any tweaking of hyperparameter of optimization tool. So the idea is a computer like this laptop, we should eventually be able to go up to 100 frames per second, right, without much of any uh, optimization, uh, which means uh, a must for adaptive optics, because now you deal with the atmosphere, you need to be fast, 10 milliseconds or something like that. Now, image-based wavefront sensing is not new by a long stretch. It has been used successfully among things for uh, the field of uh, adaptive optic in astronomy by the works done by Rodier in the 1990. I think Rodier and Rodier, they were two people. And the whole idea is um, from an image, and in this presentation we're going to, have to talk about point source, stars. Though it's not a limitation, we, we can use this technique with extended source and other kind of source. But here, that's the first application. We want to uh, take the irradiance sensed by the sensor, you know, the intensity seen by the sensor, to retrieve the phase. Now, we all know the PSF is proportional to the square of the module of the Fourier transform of the pupil phase, pupil function. The question is how we connect the PSF to the phase. Well, in most cases, there is no closed-form analytic solution. You have to go through an iteration kind of process to do that. And this is just a summary of what is commonly used. I, I don't think it's everything. It's, there are different variations around that, but I'll give you an idea where we are. So image-based wavefront sensing is split in two uh, um, parts, non-parametric techniques and parametric techniques. On a non-parametric one, you have the single image, which is known as phase retrieval. And for that to work, uh, you need to know the source because you're going to retrieve the phase from a single image. And you need to do other things. But among that, you need to know the source. 
the way he solved is through those standard, more or less, error reduction algorithm like the GS and like, but they are iterative process using uh, interactive um, Fourier transform on the constraint. You have uh, a multi-image situation where you have more than one image. Uh, it's known as phase diversity in general. In that case, you may have two images at least or more at different defocus positions along the optical path. And that's the way, when you do that, um, there is a nice property. You usually don't need to know the source. And for some application, it's very important if you don't have access to the source. Same things. To solve the problem, you go through iterative process optimization uh, techniques. Now, there is a parametric approach known as curvature sensing. Uh, that technology used by Rodier and Rodier on the case of uh, adaptive optics for a telescope. And there you need to do first the source and it must be a point source. And you solve the problem by solving uh, the Preston uh, equation uh, of the irradiance transport equation iteratively. And irradiance transport equation I tell you about the wavefront from, from two defocus image at two intra extra focal position. And the defocus must be quite large for this to work, to, for that to be a good approximation. At the end of the day, all of those require some level of optimization at runtime, which is not an option for my, my goal. I don't want that. I want to do this without any of that. That's the idea. So I work for more than 35 years in machine learning, applying them uh, in products uh, for recognition of banknotes or coins or other things. So I'm the guy from uh, machine learning, apply machine learning. And when I saw this problem, and that was also part of my thesis, I thought, well, actually what we want to do is to know this function between the PSF and the phase. And if we do the right thing, the function does exist, but we don't have an analytic form. How about learning the function? Actually, neural networks, uh, we use them a lot in the context of uh, classification, right, for image classification, all those kind of things, are learning functions from samples. And in that case, it's exactly what I want to do. I take a, a sample feed-forward neural net in terms of structure, because it's very fast when you want to uh, do the calculation runtime, and I train it in order to learn the relationship between my PSF and my phase. Now, what, what's important here, and I'll come back to that a few times don't, during this presentation, I don't want anywhere to use any actual data from the system. All of the data coming here are synthetic data. Those are just simulated data using scalar diffraction theory, Fresnel diffraction here, which means I can build database very large, be millions of samples if I want for training and validation. It takes time to do that, plus the time to train the neural net, maybe a week or more on the cloud computing. But when it's done, the time to actually get the wavefront from the image is milliseconds. It's no iteration anymore. It's the hard work was done beforehand. So here you see a nice figure made by John, actually, for a joint paper we did in SPIA, where you see the fundamental concept. So first things first, you need to express the wavefront one way or the other. And there are different ways. But in my application for now, I'm not very concerned by very high order aberrations because when you misalign the optics, you are mainly facing low order aberrations. So in that context, I can express the wavefront using the Zernike polynomials expansion, annular ones because we have most of the time a central obstruction on those telescopes coming from the secondary mirror. And I pick a set of... Uh, those polynomials who are good enough for the job, and it could be whatever I like, and then for each of them, I have a range of the possible value for the Zernike polynomial coefficient related to the level of aberration I will see, I expect to see in real life, right? Now, for each data, uh, from the, for the database, each sample, what I do is I take at random those coefficients, apply them to the Zernike polynomials, add some level of power, which is defocus, um, in the process, and we will see why. Uh, processing also uh, the, the uh, aperture function with the central obstruction, and I get a high resolution PSF. And that's an example of uh, a refractor image, where you see some level of um, trayfold 
comma, and spherical. Those high resolution images are then sampled to a much lower resolution to match the size of the image we're going to deal with from the camera uh, from our user. We have, you know, they have some sensor uh, with some pixel size, and we want to be at that range of pixel size. So we're going to lower the size of the high resolution down to a level which matches the pixel size of the user. We don't want our user to buy a new camera. And then we feed the, the image to the neural network and tell the neural network to give us the Zernic equations used to make the, this PSF. Now we could output something else than Zernic. We could have sampled the pupil. We could have also do, do other things. But come, that's a convenient way to do it. You will see we can output other information like the, the, the Fried parameter, which is a measure of the strength of the turbulence which is useful to get an idea how good uh, the image was from the actual uh, you know, condition on the sky. One thing I like to mention first here, you see the piston term on the Zernike doesn't matter. We are in, in uncurrent light. We don't care either with the Z1 and Z2 tilt of the, of the wave. We can always find the, the PSF and, and center it. So we set those three polynomials to zero. We start with the Z3, and I use uh, the the wind uh, notation here, which makes sense, I think, in this place, <laughs> for the index of the Zernike terms. And what uh, we start with um, the defocus and go up from there. Now, all of that is nice, but you need to be sure you don't have any ambiguity in the process, which means when you get a PSF, you want to have only one phase you know, to recover from that. If there is more than one phase for the same PSF, you are in trouble. So I'm just going to speak a bit about what you could do to avoid this problem from a practical st standpoint. Here it's an example where I'm in focus with my PSF, no aberration. And when I say in focus in this lecture, think about focus to minimize the R RMS error of the wavefront, which makes sense with the Zernike, which means the Z3, the defocus, is zero. I, you know, we have different ways to do that, but it's the, the assumption for now. I'm going to focus until Z3 is zero. I don't have any pure focus uh, term. And if I have three waves of primary spherical, I get this PSF. Unfortunately, if I have minus three waves of primary spherical, I get the same PSF. Now I have a problem. I cannot do that because I cannot tell the sign. How I can solve this problem? Well, first you need to understand from where I come from. This problem is coming from actually quite common three trivial issue when you do phase retrieval, at least with 2D and more. Um, you have the global phase uh, ambiguity, which is typically the piston, and we don't care for this one. Nor do we care about the spatial shift coming from the tilt tip of the wave. We are left over with the last one, which is a conjugate inversion uh, ambiguity. And that's the last trivial ambiguity on those problems. And it can be traced back to the OTF when you look at the OTF as the complex cross correlation function of the pupil function. If you look at the OTF, which is also the Fourier transform of the PSF, if two OTF are the same, well, then we have the two PSF the same and we have the ambiguity. Well, if you take your pupil function here and you do the convolution, there is another one here, which is the conjugate inversion, who gives you the same thing. Conjugate inversion is a conjugate of the complex function, and you just you know, change the sign of x and y. So that's your ambiguity. You have your pupil function, and you have an alternate you know, ambiguity solution, which is a conjugate inversion. Now, usually it doesn't matter much for the real part, uh, I mean, the, the module of the pupil function, if you have a circular aperture, and this is usually an even function, and we don't care much about that. Uh, we don't have much of any problem. But we do have a problem with the phase, which is usually made of even and odd parts. So how are we going to solve the phase issue, which is what we want to retrieve here? Well, it's quite simple, in fact. The idea is just to add some kind of modulation in the phase. Known modulation. I would say no, known bias. And, if, and it's not the only one. We talked today about using other ways, like um, perhaps uh, spherical aberration. But a, a, a simple one, which is cheap to do, is defocus. You add a quadratic phase on the system, 
and, and it's easy to do because you just have to move the sensor away from the focal plane. I'm talking about the focal plane because we take image of objects so far away, we are on the focal plane uh, when the image uh, appears. And if you assume the, 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 the pupil uh, function the phase uh, of a uh, PSF uh, focus is this phi p, then we pick a, a bias for the, for the defocus, a, a scalar b, which is used uh, to, through the defocus uh, function here, which is a quadratic uh, phase. And we also have to pick a delta b, uh, because we, we don't know if the defocus we are applying is totally uh, you know, perfect. We may have some error in defocus from a practical standpoint, for any reason. And when you do that, you see here the first solution, the one you like, is you have your new phase with the bias, which is your pupil, uh, plus the bias uh, from, from the, from the def defocus term, from the quadratic term, which is B plus delta B. Now, the ambiguity is like before, and you have the same problem with the pupil phase, but now look at the effect of the bias. Now you have a negative sign here. It's opposed. And of course, when you defocus, you are on one side or the other, you know, intra or extra focal. You cannot be both in the same time. Unless, of course, delta B plus B is zero, which means you didn't defocus anything, right? So you need to be sure to avoid any sign problems and ambiguity. Then B plus delta B is greater than zero. And delta B is pretty much your defocus budget you have for your problem. And it must include a few things. Um, how much you were able to actually in focus to begin with. I told you I want to be in focus with minimum RMS wave front error. How I'm going to do that? How accurate can I be? Even if I was, when I defocus, you know, how, how good my defocus by moving, for instance, my sensor is. So all those unknowns, and, and, and after that, assuming I was on axis when I did all of that, when I go off axis, I have to deal with field curvature, sensor tilt, and other source of defocus. All of that needs to be uh, no, accounted for on this delta B uh, magnitude of the possible error. So the simple way to solve the problem is you, you decide what delta B would be, and you be sure your defocus is minimum, is in magnitude, is bigger than that maximum possible error you may find. Such, such we have always a defocus. And we know the sign of it. Now, in the real life, we defocus usually way more than this maximum. And the reason for that is back to my application. I need to have enough pixels across the defocus PSF to do something with that. Because I have those cameras already there. I don't have, I cannot change them. So usually we are defocusing by waves, quite many waves, which means we can always um, meet this requirement. And the other nice thing is the neural network is going to output the Zernike coefficient, including the delta B, which is an aberration like any other. Yeah? So we can know from the output of the neural net if the defocus is, is indeed in an expected range. And this way, know if we can trust the result. So how much we need to defocus? Uh, it's given by this sample relationship. It's a function of how much, how much bias we want. It's also a function of the central aperture uh, obstruction, um, linear one, and the square of the f number of the system in the case of the object at infinity and lambda. Now, when you do that, the ambiguity is gone. Eh? You see on the, f on the top part, the problem we had before with two different situations where we have the same PSF. Now, if I defocus by 10 waves to make a point here, then I get this nice uh, new PSF defocused. Plus three wave and minus three wave give you a totally different pattern. Right. And your problem actually is only for situation with even part of the phase, but you know, like spherical. Okay, so if we know what to do, and, and don't make me wrong, you can still have phase ambiguity if you have more defocus error than, than that uh, defocus kind of things. You need to know what you're doing. Now, how are you going to train a neural net? Well, I don't want to train a neural net for each telescope out there. It will be too much work. And I come from the practical side of machine learning. I trust machine learning up to some level. 
I want to be sure I have done my work first in order to provide the neural net what is useful for the job, not more, and remove all the possible unknown from the process first. So some kind of pre-processing needs to be done. So here what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to pick a, a standard normalized data set where I set the radius of the app pupil to one, diameter to two, which is totally consistent with the Zernike polynomials, and lambda one. And there will be a denormalization phase for an actual optics. Right. I'm going to train all the neural net for at least a class of telescope, think about the same central obstruction kind of things, with those normalized data. Now, of course, uh, you are in the digital world. You use the scalar diffraction theory to compute the um, defocus image and PSF with the bias. And you sample the pupil n by n. And you use the FFT 2D. So n is usually a, a power of 2 to be efficient. Compute the, the module and test square to get the, the PSF. So when you sample the pupil, uh, I sample by m point the radius, 2m the diameter. I use m large enough such I don't have aliasing issues, or if there is any, they are on the noise floor. And n is, is, must be um, a greater than, than m, so I'm doing zero padding. And we can talk about the condition on m, but that's detailed, because there are non-trivial phase ambiguity if you don't do the right thing. But if you do the right thing, you don't have this problem anymore. So the delta theta here is my resolution, my sampling period of the PSF based to two numbers, m, how many pixels around the radius of the pupil, normalized pupil, and n, how many sample, uh, you know, n point by n point image, uh, um, I mean, sampling of the pupil. The PSF, of course, is also n, n by n by nature of the FFT. With that, I need now to connect the dot with an actual optics. So the way it works is I need to find the matching between the camera image with their pixels for a given optical setup with a neural network normalized image I feed. And those are much smaller, as I said before, than the 1,000 I was talking earlier, more in a range of 128 or 256. So the way it works is you take the size um, of your neural network and you know the telescope optics and you can relate the delta theta, which, are, which is the resolution for the normalized data, to the actual size of the pixels at the focal plane uh, for your neural network uh, image. And those are related to N and L and they are just scaling linearly with lambda and, and f being the focal length and are inversely proportional to the radius, which makes sense if you think about the size of the PSF. So at the end of the day is m over l times lambda times two times the focal, uh, the f number, sorry, of the, of the telescope. So, it's, so now I have the size of the simulated image seen by this optical system in, let's say, microns or whatever. I can compare them to my pixel size of my camera. And usually, the neural network pixel size is bigger. Camera is smaller pixel. I design it such it does that. And I need a simple, smart, but simple uh, interpolation algorithm to resize the image from, from the camera to match the size of the neural network image I need to fit to the neural network. Now, they are a little bit more pre-processing before that to scale the data and stuff like that, but that's out of scope. An example, at 650 nanometer, open at f8, I use typically M100 to be way away, away from the um, aliasing. L128 for the neural net gives you pixel around 8 microns, which is totally consistent with the size of pixel of the camera we have out there. Few microns up to maybe 9 microns, so we can easily match them from a practical standpoint. So I did all of that and published that in 2020 in the SPI conference in uh, Strasbourg, uh, Photonics Europe, which I couldn't go because, you know, we had the COVID back then. <laughs> so it was a remote one, but it was a bit of frustration because I had booths and everything ready for there. And then I talked about that and with John, and John said, that's fine, but now you have to show good that stuff maybe, right? I'll believe it when I see, <laughs> basically. 
And, and we start to work together for a, a new uh, SPIA paper where we can compare the result of that against a known system. So I built this contraption, which is an optical bench, which I'm going to use later in the presentation for the demonstration. That's a bench John used in, in the paper. So it's a very simple telescope. It's a single achromat, an inch, roughly, aperture, open at 12.5. And there are seven micro, uh, ten holes, uh, microns, I'm sorry, seven, ten micron spin holes uh, here, illuminated by a white LED and there is a diffuser. The goal of those seven pinholes are artificial stars across the field, such I can have on and off axis data at once with a single image, which is a very nice property of this technique because you can get everything from a single frame. So if you look at the, here the figure, you see the pinholes with the LED, the beam splitter, the achromat, a nice flat mirror, double pass mode, the lights come back, the red filter, usually I use a red filter because in the, in the application, red, longer wavelengths have less seeing effect problem, and the camera which needs to be moved for defocusing in a practical way. And if you look at the bench over here, you see all of that. Notice here there is a thumb screw, which you can tie to stress the mirror and create some level of aberration, uh, you know, up to what you like. And such, this way we can analyze the wavefront without aberration and with some level of aberration, mainly astigmatism and coma. What you're going to see during the demonstration is this kind of image where you have seven pinholes on the vertical line. Pinhole number zero, by definition, will be the on axis. Minus one, two, and minus three are off axis down. Plus one, plus two, plus three are up, as, up axis, right? Um, up to 4.5 millimeter here, quite off axis. So let's see what we get when we use that. So John took that, he went back to his friend from 4D technology, and he tried, you know, um, he, he did the comparison between this solution with the camera and the AI with the face cam, which is the golden standard in that case. So you can see a picture of that. You have the face cam, and of course when we use the face cam, we remove the camera shooting the beam to the system for the measurement of a wavefront. And here, of course, we don't use the beam. We use the camera with the pinholes and the beam splitter. Also, John did what he could to be sure we are measuring the same thing at the same location. But by nature of the beast, there will be always an error because it's not the same source. Uh, one is a pinhole, the other one is a laser from the face cam. So some result, if you want to know more, you get more of those data on the SPA uh, proceeding. What you see here uh, is a result for a flat mirror, when, when there is no stress on the mirror. 10 micron spin hole on axis. We use a, a red narrow band filter, 6 nanometer, to narrow the band and be close to the wave, wavelengths of the laser. And all the results are in uh, milliwaves. They are, um, you know, um, Aberration in terms of um, third order, the aberration at the edge of the pupil. So you can see here the, the heat plot of the wavefront. Peaks are in red, trough are in blue, and that's AI solution. And on the right, you get the same thing for the same aberration from the face cam data. So they look quite the same. And the data here in the table shows so. The maximum error we had was 25 milliwaves for astigmatism third order. Not too bad. But we suspected some of it may be coming from the fact we are not looking exactly at the same location. So we did more work, and this is the latest result using the Schachartmann. The, the nice things with the Schachartmann, I can use the same source with the same filter at the same location in the field. So I removed this unknown from the equation. I plug a Schachartmann here instead of the camera, and I can measure the same thing. This is the result when you use the Schachartmann. The Schachartmann uh, was 200 millisecond exposure because you need enough time to get enough light. But the nice thing with the AI solution is only 10 milliseconds, just to show you could go up to 10, you know, 100 frames a second. Um, 10 milliseconds works in this context. And here, the maximum error was 
two milliwaves, uh, roughly 1.3 nanometer. The RMS difference is 1.4 milliwave a nanometer. So we see we get a pretty good result at the lab. They match very well uh, in the interferometer or the shank hartmann Now the que next question for me, well, now what does it do on the sky? Because that's the, the final goal. So John again <laughs> was in the process to buy a new telescope. And he said, OK, I need to do a commission uh, process first. I want to be sure the scope meets my expectation, basically at least the straight ratio. So he took a face cam and went to the company who make the telescope plane wave. And this is a picture of the contraption for the test. You see the face cam on the bottom shooting the beam through the back of the scope. On the top of it, you have a nice, probably very expensive flat mirror uh, to do the, the measurement. And this is a high resolution result from the face cam. So it's very high uh, spatial resolution. What you see is some roughness on the wavefront. You can spot three peaks coming from tree fall aberration, and you can trace them back to some stress on the mirror by the mount. And you see some level of uh, spherical aberration. But those are small. I think the strel was 85, if I remember correctly. So John took the scope and bought it. And he went back to his location, you know, not here, but in Oregon in that case, and took some picture with the scope in the sky and sent that to me. Say, okay, now can you tell me what is uh, no, the, the quality of the optic of that telescope? I have data to compare with. This is a slide John did to summarize the results. On the left side, you see the AI solutions taking a single image under seeing limited condition. And the image is over here. This is a raw image, and you can see the effect of seeing uh, on the image. And you see even the diffraction pattern of the spider for the secondary mirror. The, I think the seeing was, I would say, average back then. Yeah, it was good. OK. It was good for you, depending on the place. And he took, so I took this image, the raw image, and sent it to the neural net for calculation of the Zernike polynomials. Hmm? That's the defocus image. Yeah, it was defocused by 4 millimeter roughly, which is part of the, the condition for the data simulated for the neural net. And the choice is, is a lot about we have enough pixel across the defocus image for, for be able to use this technique for the camera of the user. So that was a single image, one shot. I don't know, I don't remember the exposure time. Maybe one minute, 30 seconds, you remember? It was, it was probably uh, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. John took another one uh, at intra-focus on the other side of the focus just for you know, completeness. And you can see this one doesn't look the same because we have spherical aberration. Not a lot, but it's enough to see the difference now. So this is the AI solution. And this is a 2D face cam solution. They don't have the same color plot. And of course, the um, face cam has a much higher resolution. But you see the peaks from the threefold. You see the spherical. Same thing here. If you compare, and this is a result of averaging 5, 12 frames at the lab. Of course, there is no turbulence, but they are very short exposure. Well, I'm sorry. We ran fans to stir things up, and then we averaged down to... And you take enough time between the frames such that there is no uh, relationship anymore, right? time-wise. So this is 5, 12 frames, and this is a single one. RMS-wise, in terms of wavefront error, 70 milliwave for the AI, he found 64.7 with a phase cam. So we are at a few thousand of milliwaves, the same. Strels are very similar. But there is another way to get an idea how good we were to capture those tiny amount of vibration. Keep in mind, it's not much. And we still sp spot the tray fall. I'm not sure the folks from plain wave were happy to hear that. But <laughs> so those are the raw images. And from there, using the output of the neural net, right, I computed the solution with the same Zernike and the estimation of the thing coming from the output of the neural net through the Fried parameter, and build those defocus images to match what John did, adding, I did even add some level of uh, diffraction in a spi uh, spike. 
And, and you can compare them. Remember, this one was never seen by the neural net, and it's pretty close. This one was you know, seen, but it's also very close. They are a bit sharper because the calculation is monochromatic. It's not a limitation of the technique. It's good enough for the job, so I don't want to do more work than I need to do. So now you can see we did capture, indeed, quite well the waveform. Under seeing limited condition, you know. And that was my goal. Another one I did, uh, I went to the Patrick Space Force Base in Florida, training those people on our product, including this technique, because they have big scope and they have problems. <laughs> you will see. So, and I have to thank them, uh, the folks from the own generation next, to give me the authorization today to show you the data. This is another test done, um, with, you know, on, on the sky. There, they have a bunch of telescopes to track uh, rocket launch, track that. And that was a, a half a meter, roughly, telescope open at F9, uh, schmidt cassegrain a Swiss telescope, by the way, a contraverse. And I took very short exposure. It turns out then I had a Shaq Hartman with me. So I could do both. I had that camera like this, a Shaq Hartman, and we could un interchange them. So at the same time, pretty much at the same place, on the same target, I could compare and get data. It was another opportunity to get more data. And here you, you have the results. Uh, the thing wasn't great. You don't go in Florida to do deep space imaging. You go there to have many things, including, you know, fun by wa watching the rocket launch. And this is the two with same color plot, the two wavefront um, heat plot for the Shaq Hartman and the AI solution for that image. Five seconds is very short, if you consider the level of seeing we have here. Despite that, we have very close results, the same kind of PSF without seeing here. Those are the results. Uh, maximum difference was 60 milliwave, and the R RMS difference was 50 milliwave. Now, if you convert that in wave RMS, it's 10 milliwave RMS, and keep in mind the diffraction limit 0.8 is roughly 75 milliwave RMS. So we are seven times, you know, uh, in terms of difference, better than what we need to spot uh, the diffraction limit. Now, this scope is not very, you know, well aligned. You can spot that. The strain ratio is 0.14. And they were very surprised, say, yeah, yeah, you have a problem with the scope. And that scope, just for the story, has a story behind. That scope was used during the launch of many of the shuttles, including Columbia. If you remember, Columbia had, unfortunately, a problem at, at, at the return due to uh, a, one of the tiles who was missing. And they look at the video record from that telescope to find out it was coming from a piece of foam detached from the, the, the big uh, tank who hit the leading edge of the wing, just to know. I don't know what the strain ratio was when they took the video. <laughs> it was some time back. I hope it was better, but whatever. Anyway, um, some conclusion before I, I go for the demonstration. That's a single image, low cost, no extra hardware solution, Flex flexible, because we use only synthetic data. We can do many different things. It's pretty fast. On that PC, I can run 20 frames per second, uh, 11 Zernike terms, and without doing anything special. So I think accessing 100 frames per second for adaptive optic is totally in reach without designing a very complex hardware with you know, DSP, GPU, whatever. That's my goal, too, for the next. And we have a project, not in adaptive optic, but we have a project in Turkey for a four-meter telescope, the DAG project, if you, if you Google D-A-J. And DAG is an infrared four-meter. And they already have adaptive optics for the science, but they need a way for active optics, keeping the mirror aligned, but also the shape of the mirror. They have 64 actuators. And in that context, we're going to use our technique using cameras off axis and defocus and getting plenty of wavefronts to compute all we need to act on the actuators and realign the optics. It's much simpler and cheaper to do. There is no part in motion on top of that. If you use Shaq Hartman, you have to move them to find the star up there. Here we don't move anything. Uh, we have access to the whole field to sense more than one um, you know, one star at the time, if you have more than one, with no extra sensor or any, any motion. We can output the Zernike coefficient, the freed parameter, or anything that makes sense. 
we have a large dynamic range and we are very well immune to the noise. You saw, you saw how much we can get from the noise from the seeing and still we achieve pretty good results. Basically, um, I did some tests at the lab. I can go and I don't see any limit yet, but I can, it's a matter of SNR more than anything, I would say. I've been to the Z35, which is the ninth spherical, just to see how far we can go with the Zernike uh, polynomials and still have good results on the wavefront reconstruction with the neural network. Lab accuracy is around four milliwave RMS in the red wavelengths from the experiments. The sky accuracy is around 20 milliwaves, which is plenty for what we need to do. Back to my point, diffraction limit is at 75. And without going crazy with new camera, smaller pixel kind of things, using what we have already. Estimation of the precision repatibility, assuming everything is the same, is around a few thousand of a wave RMS. Okay, that's my presentation on the slide part. And let me show you how does it work in real life with this bench. Uh, I, not many. It's a shallow network. Uh, three hidden layers in one output with few thousand neurons for each layer. Because keep in mind, we are not going to recognize a pig against a plane or a tree or whatever out there. We have to recognize those defocus image and the space, the functional space is, is quite limited. So it works very well because the problem is well defined. As you saw, I did what I could to be sure everything is set right before I train the neural net. I don't, I don't see neural network or in general machine learning like black boxes. I push very hard back against that. Although I work on that for many years, I'm very careful those machine does the right job at the right time at the right place. It's not a black box. I don't know what it is inside and I don't know if I can trust the results. So it's not deep learning. Yes. specific cutoff frequency based on the focal length then for the, the, the frequency cutoff. How do you um, square that then with an actual system's cutoff frequency? All you need to do is just to match the pixel size. Everything comes automatically behind that. No, it looks like, it looks like strange, but it does work. Well, we can talk more offline if you wish, and we can have a look to the paper. Yeah. Now, there are limitations to that too. And if the central obstruction is not the same, you have to rethink about the processing, redo the database. The other thing is the seeing. The, the seeing impact is a function of the ratio between the aperture D and the free parameter, D over R zero. And that, if the, if the D is too different, then you have maybe to change the simulation of the noise to meet the DR level you may see in, in real life. Beside that, you, you, know, you don't have any problem, which is, I guess, a good news. So what I could do now, I show you how does it work in that bench. It works the same way on a telescope of one meter. We have done quite some data in Chile lately, working with a company there who takes care of many telescopes. And if I, I think I need to close that presentation such you can see the nice beach here. And I can start the lights over here. And so this is a prototype software. I wrote it in, in Python. So it's not very fast, not very fancy. That was not the point. We get an image every one second or so from the camera. And I just need to realign everything. You see my pinholes, the seven pinholes you saw on the slide. And let's recenter it a bit better. Uh, of course, the other way around. Here we are, more or less. We don't need to be super accurate here for the demonstration. So we get an image every one second or so. You see the, here you see the, the frame uh, counter. And if I put that full screen, yeah, I can adjust a bit more, I guess, um, this way. 
No, the other way. <laughs> of course. No, I try it many times to be sure I knew, and every time I'm wrong. And, and that's probably Mr. Murphy. Okay, so you see now those frames coming, and we have seven pinholes on axis and off axis. If I show you that's a wavefront of pinhole zero, as we go, you can see live the data. Uh, they change a bit here. It's pretty good thread. Of course, it's a 12.5 op system, so it's, you know, it's pretty slow. The system tells me from the ZRNK polynomial, in that case from the defocus one, I'm 20, 30 microns away from the optimal defocus value for the model, which is totally in range with the tolerance I was talking before. Uh, the RMS is pretty low because the thread is so high. And here you, you see the, the total astigmatism, comma, trifold, and spherical for the ZRNK terms. The ZRNK coefficients are down there. And you see the two um, 2D heat plots of the wavefront. So the dominant aberration in this case, not much because the, str the strel is 99, is astigmatism. It can be traced from the flat mirror. It's good, but not that good. Right? It's good enough. Is at 45 degrees, roughly, not exactly, but roughly. You have a spherical uh, of around 6 milliwave ish. Um, comma and trefold are pretty low. And that's totally consistent with the Zmax model we have for this achromat. So nothing surprises us here. Now, if I go to the next pinhole and the next pinhole and so on and so forth, see what's happened. So watch the, the aberration plot here and see what's happened. Go to the next pinhole. And what we see, well, what we should see is increase uh, uh, in uh, astigmatism because we go off axis on the achromat. There is no much difference in coma nor in spherical. Spherical is not supposed to be a field dependent aberration anyway. When everything is at least well aligned and everything is fine. So now I go up to one more, even more astigmatism. And the last one, which is 4.5 millimeter away, I'm roughly around 40, 45 milliwaves. The fluctuations are coming from the noise and maybe the light a bit, you know, kind of things. Look at the, the um, astigmatism. Now is pretty much vertical. With a little some tilt coming from probably the mirror who was at 45. You would expect that to be vertical because you move a vertical line along the, in the, the field and you get more and more. If you look at 40, 40, 45, I go down now to the pinhole number minus 3 down. And if I do that, I get pretty much the same thing, 40 milli, you know, which means I'm probably pretty much close to the optical axis of the system. Uh, you can see from there the PSF. Even with the astigmatism of axis, pretty good. And the square root is maybe even better to get an idea of what you see. Okay, now let's go back here with our pinholes and uh, go back here first. I go to the pinhole on axis zero and I'm going to tie that screw. That's not going to be good. So if I tie the screw, well, he lost, well, now, you see what you would expect. Look at the astigmatism, he's off the chart, right? And by the way, he's at 45 degrees now because I, I have a thumb screw at 45 degrees. My strel is down to 70, 68 now, pretty low compared to before, can even tight more. Of course, uh, the PSF shows quite some astigmatism at 45, oblique astigmatism. And if I uh, relax, we should go back to where we were before, after some transition on the wavefront. That's a bench John took to do the measurement on the, sh on the face cam and then the one I used to test with the Shack Hartman too. The last things I like to show you, and I'm very glad the software works just fine. Mr. Murphy is not there yet. Let's keep that way. Okay, so I stop that one for now and uh, show you um, basically the kind of things we do for our customer. This, this is a software named Skywave. And behind the scene, there is this wavefront sensing AI solution engine. 
That's an image I got from uh, Vincent, uh, a guy in Chile who takes care of a lot of telescopes, including John's telescope. And that's coming from a half meter telescope. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, an image he took with uh, many stars, so it's a star field. You can see all those stars there, more or, uh, more or less uh, uh, bright. And from there, we can look at all the solution wavefront one star at a time. And this is the on-axis one, the closest to the on-axis. Uh, you can see the wavefront here. It's, again, we see the trayfold. <laughs> Nothing new here. But you see, um, because that's a common thing. And it doesn't mean it's a big deal, because usually it's way below the diffraction limit anyway. But you need to support the mirror, and there's no way to avoid absolutely no stress. Right. So you get some kind of thing like that on this scope. And the trail is not that great, 60. Uh, there's still some work to do on the alignment of the telescope. The dominant aberration is threefold. We have some astigmatism. And you can see here the PSF with typical sign of threefold. One of the things the tools uh, gives you is, because it's nice to know if you have or not reach the diffraction limit, but you are most likely, especially with one meter telescope, uh, seeing limited long before you are diffraction limited. So you want to see how good your telescope is going to work in the actual conditions. So the software shows you that you can see the seeing limited PSF for that scope. And you see it's not very great if the thing is 5, 0.5 arcs ago. You have, a, you have a triangle shape. And if you compare with the same thing under uh, diffraction limited condition, you, you should get that. It's pretty much, you know, quite large. And you see the airy disk in green here. Now, if the thing, I think the time he did the, uh, the measurement, the thing was 1.5 arc seconds. If I go 1.5 here, then the same optics is less an issue. Right. So the good news, if you have bad optics, go where the thing is bad and you're fine. It's still not perfect, because if you compare here, you can see that. Yeah. And of course, because the strel is around 50%, the MTF doesn't look good either, because we have dropped by roughly 50%. You know, the surface of the, the MTF is related to the strel if you compare with the diffraction limited one and what we actually get. Uh, the last thing to look at is the field information. And this is the image tilt using all those stars. We have 20 or whatever, I forgot, in the field we can use. And you have here a 3D plot of the tilt. And I show you later, you know, you see we have some tilt. Not a lot, but still some tilt on, probably somewhere in, in the camera or somewhere in between. We can also access, because um, it's the 2D first, the field curvature, which is not center, which tells us we are not aligned yet, assuming the camera is supposed to be center with the optical axis, which I would expect it is. And you can also uh, pick a bunch of aberration. And, and select only the one you like and tell the system, give me the field dependent aberration for this one. And that's a very important one we are working with um, for active optic. Now, I, I have a very good relationship with uh, Stefan Gizar of the European Space Agency. He wants me to go there to give the same kind of talk to the folks there. He's one of the guys who designed and um, among things the, the VLT system and the active optics and everything around that. He's a French guy, he's in Germany, headquarter of the European Space Agency. The telescope is in Chile. And there is a nice paper, he's a co-author of a nice paper, which is pretty old now, who explain how to use the field-dependent astigmatism, oblique and, you know, and um, uh, vertical, to get the information about the alignment of the mirror in one step, as long as you have enough data enough defocus image here of star to get enough field information. That's the way we're going to use it for the DAG project in Turkey. Where we are working together with his uh, support because he, he was very happy to see there are some people trying to do optical stuff for telescope, not just guessing. 
Uh, I think that's pretty much it for me for today. I, I hope you get the ID. I mean, it works. Um, the other things is it's machine learning, but it's not crazy machine learning. It's machine learning on the control. You do science, and then you do machine learning when it makes sense. That would be one of the things you should remember from this presentation if you like machine learning. If you do marketing forecast, maybe you can go with whatever you like. <laughs> because as long as you are better, better than a human, you're good. But if you go with um, metrology, you, you want to be careful. Among the other projects, you know, and there is another one where I cannot say everything because IP aspect for now, but you can do that with phase diversity, where you don't know the, um, the source, and be generic as that, which is a very interesting possibility for some applications, of course. But thank you, if you have any questions, you know. Um,